Thank you all for taking your Saturday afternoon and evening to be with us tonight. We will begin with you to just give us a two-minute journey on how you got here, and here meaning not room 104 A and B, because I heard it was like a tricky situation, but here in the entertainment industry, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you, I mean, you, you have such different identities. How did you get into the entertainment industry? Two minutes. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for MPAC for this opportunity. Um, uh, it's actually a twist of fate because I uh, literally, what, like I was doing my general surgery residency and I got this random email about, um, you know, uh, Grey's Anatomy wanted like writers who's done like general surgery training in order to be like the voices of the show. Because um, it's all about like authentic portrayal. Um, I was a fan of the show. Actually, one of the reasons why I came to America like, and become a surgeon is because of the show, which was very ironic. I was like a windblown refugee like in Syria when I was watching those pirated CDs of Grey's Anatomy. And it was just like a full circle. So I, they interviewed me, I got the job, and they liked me. I've been there for six years. Wonderful, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Kasim? So I, I fell in love with film uh, at a class in high school when I was 16. Uh, I then said, this is amazing, but no one does this. Who does this, like, makes movies? It was, seemed so, like, grand and huge. I, I ne I'd never known anyone in this space, so I, fi I figured I'd do it for a hobby. Uh, and so I start shooting stuff around the neighborhood with my brother, my cousins, friends. Um, when I was uh, a senior in, in college, so I was going to school to become a lawyer too, and I, I have a degree in criminal justice and pre-law. And the summer before I took my LSAT, I, I'd been practicing. Uh, I'd just taken the practice LSAT, set my time for the real one. And I was in this major car accident where I flew through the window and nearly died. Um, which at the time was quite tragic, uh, but in retrospect, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to me. Because I, I consider, I mean, I think, I think sometimes it's an advantage to face mortality. And you, you kind of, I, I think a lot of our deepest fears is, is that. And so when you face it when you're 21 or 22, it, it becomes less of a fear. So then after that, I, I, it was sort of this metaphor because my LSAT books burned in the car, right? Like, oh. I can't even, I can't make this stuff up. And I was like, all right, well, if, uh, and then I had some issues after that, like just going through healing and uh, physically and psychologically. And after that, I said, well, let me make a movie about what I went through. It was called Inner Struggle. And it was like, technically it wasn't all that, but there was something there. My aunt, who's in advertising, was like, there's something here. So I started showing this movie around campus. Uh, I finished with that degree, um, then I just went head strong, like head first into the movie thing and just started shooting stuff around Detroit. Um, shot a couple things, rented some theaters, had some screenings, moved to New York, made another movie with Danny Glover and Evan Ross and all of them. I mean, there's a lot in between. A lot of pain in between and all that, but you know, that, that's just, we got two minutes, so um, I made that film. Uh, that film took me around the world, Muslim, um, and then uh, uh, and then I made another in, uh, called Destined, and then eventually I, I made my way to Boy Girl a Dream, which was which premiered at Sundance last year. Right. And yeah. Thank you. Zara? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm the daughter of Pakistani and Indian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the 70s. They were both doctors. And they were very, uh, a little disappointed that their four children, none of us, became medical doctors. Uh, I grew up loving cartoons and animation, and I wanted to draw and become an animator. Uh, but when I got to Wellesley College, just outside of Boston for my undergrad, uh, the theater department seduced and bewitched me. And uh, I went ahead and I ended up majoring in Japanese language and literature. I lived and worked in Japan for a little while in the theater, uh, studying acting there. Uh, I then spent several years on the East Coast uh, doing theater regionally, New York, Washington, D.C., toured around for a bit with my own solo show, which was a comedic love letter to the experience of growing up as a Muslim in America, uh, before finally moving out to L.A. about eight years ago, where I really started to explore um, that love I had for animation, and I married it to my love of acting, and I now primarily make my living uh, doing voiceover for animation, for cartoons, for video games, and pursuing on-camera work as well. 
Um, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fazia Mirza, and uh, my LSAT books did not burn in any fire. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I was in, I acted and did band and speech team when I was in high school. I grew up in Canada, and uh, go speech. Um, and I went to my parents. My dad was a doctor. My brother became a doctor. My sister became an architect. Um, so it was like, Fazia, are you going to become a doctor? or an engineer, or a doctor, <laughs> or a lawyer. And so law school seemed like the, the least painful. Uh, you know, it was only three years. So I went to law school, um, and I went, I, I took, I mean, I took the bar exam, but also I found something in law school. My favorite part of law school was actually a class called trial advocacy. Trial advocacy is uh, a class where you learn the rules of evidence. And so what I loved about learning objections and cross-examinations and opening and closing arguments is that it was l a lot less like lawyering and it's much more like acting. So what I started doing was, I know, they can bite you anywhere. Um, and so what I started doing was I became a lawyer, I became a litigator for about three years and I started lawyering by day and taking acting classes and comedy classes and improv classes at night. Um, and I did that for about three years and then knew that I didn't want to be a lawyer anymore, especially not the law firm I was working at. It was pretty toxic. Um, and so I left to do comedy, educational, sexual violence prevention training and performance work. So that had me performing at colleges and universities around the country and military installations around the world. And I did that work for about nine years while I also was figuring out what it meant to be a act, an actor. And uh, I kind of got to hear through the fact that I found that I'd go in as an actor and you know I wasn't Muslim enough or brown and I, I didn't seem enough for any of the roles. And so I started writing and independently producing and writing and creating and starring in and casting the people I knew and loved in my community in Chicago and eventually made short films and web series. Um, my feature film, Signature Move, was great because I got to work with Shabana Azmi, who some of you may know. She played my mom. Um, and uh, my mom was like, Fazia. Was, she was like, Why don't, what about me? And I was like, <laughs> well, I said, mom, do you want to play my mom? And she's like, I don't need to play your mom. <laughs> I am your mom. Um, and then that, you know, through all that work, it kind of got me to writing for, I moved to LA about a year and a half ago uh, to write for uh, TV for the Red Line and um, have stayed in LA since and now developing a lot of my own TV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, did you plan that the microphones match the outfits? Oh, but I no, love I did that. not. Oh, um, no. Mine's purple. Yeah, anyway. we planned that because Impact <laughs> thinks of everything. It's awesome. Um, we did. We did plan that. Uh, what, what's up with, with Middle Eastern moms that are always like, I can do that. I can, <laughs> I can act. I know how to do it. Um, so I am from Iraq, and I grew up in Kentucky. And um, when I went, I was wanting to go to college. My mom said, you don't know what you want to major in. I'm not going to pay for you to go somewhere else, so you can just go here. And I, um, I'd always liked to tell stories, but I didn't understand what that was. So I, I um, became a journalist, or I, I, I majored in journalism, but with one caveat, I had to double major in medicine or something, <laughs> because you know, you're not gonna make money. Well, around this time, Christian Amanpour burst on the scene, and so my parents were like, oh, you can be like Christian Amanpour, great. So um, then I broke their hearts when I, uh, graduated, worked in news, local news for a little bit, and decided I don't want to report on the news. I want to make up stories. So I came out to film school and um, thought I was going to be a big time director. And I've always had this skill as an editor. And also, I love to be in rooms and not talk to people, <laughs> uh, except for this. I love this. Um, but uh, so I, I just kind of um, fell into editing. And I started doing that as a day job and then realized that um, and so then I was working at Miramax and then eventually Eventually Weinstein, and we all know the story with that. Um, feel free to ask me I'm about that. I'm not going to ask anything. Okay. But anyway, but um, so then uh, it, around this time, I also thought, well, I want to start. I want to write, and I want to write stories that are, um, you know, important to me. And for me, that was always this story of uh, it was always comedy. It was always a dysfunctional uh, Middle Eastern family that loved each other, but was the, the main character was always trying to get away mm -hmm. from. And you know, kind of made the rounds. I had some pilots optioned, and then uh, a mentor told me, "What are you doing? Why don't you just tell your story?" And I 
had this series of essays that I put together in a book. It was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life uh, because it's my, it's me. I'm not writing as a character, but it was the most liberating thing, and um, and that's how my book um, was born. So thank you and welcome. So we're going to start off with an easy question, and we're going to kind of put the spotlight on the industry before we put it on ourselves. How can we um, help non-Muslim creatives and executives expand their concept of Muslim narratives so they, under they understand that we're not a monolith and that we actually have intersectional identities? So, and, and I want this to be interactive, so just jump in. You all, have, you all have worked with non-Muslim creatives and executives. And, and I know at one point or another you had to push back on you know, certain things, I'm sure. Um, so how do you handle the non-Muslim creatives and, and executives? Fazi, you look like you want to start. You go. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I can start like with um, when we tackled the, the character that we had in Grey's Anatomy. So after the Muslim ban, like there was, you know, like right after, right after it, like there was a lot of awareness about like who are Muslims, who are like women wearing hijab, like, and then the writers automatically they turned to me as a Middle Eastern person, um, and they said like, hey Nasser, so we want, we are interested in b building this character, like how how like hijabi women would act, like behave, like mm -hmm. what are their limitations. And the more I go, I felt like I'm, it's not real and authentic that I speak on the behalf of women wearing hijab. So that's when we said, you know what, we need the voices of women wearing hijab to tell us the story. Because otherwise, I cannot, I'm a man and I cannot like, you know, give the authenticity of their daily struggle or even just normalcy of their life. So MPAC was you know, very essential in connecting us with women um, who are actually dealing with this on a daily basis. And what I loved about this, for me, a woman wearing hijab was always like there's one concept, like it is very monolithic, as you said. And when I discovered there is spectra of women wearing hijab, every woman had a different identity about what hijab is. And like about the limitations, because it reflects on their personality and psyche and character. So that's really helped us in building this character to make her unique in terms of this is not a message. It's a very nuanced character. It's not about her faith or religion. It's just like that she happens to exist and she has integrity. She's a doctor and she's just part of like, a, you know, that like fabric. Uh, so I think it really helped us just to, I mean, the writers were mesmerized by the stories that they heard from hijabi woman because to them it was a whole different story about like oppression being forced to wear it and now we hear like young people who just like decides that this is my identity it's a statement um, so it was really like an eye-opening experience I think for me as a Muslim person that like I saw it from a different perspective um, so you can only imagine how it feels for non-Muslims yeah. Fazia before I get to you can I just say one yeah. thing right. Layla El Miryadi is in the room can you stand up or is she Layla, so stand up, Layla. So, well, I mean, so basically when they, when Grey's Anatomy, okay, you can sit down. When, when Grey's Anatomy, when they called, we worked closely with Nasser and, you know, we, the, he said basically we want to learn more about how uh, hijabi surgeons perform. You know, not being a hijabi, I also didn't want to go in into the writer's room and, and, and tell them how, you know, hijabi surgeons perform. So I did bring in Layla Nadina Lekovic, and Layla pitched a story about how she, when she took off her hijab to stop the hemorrhaging, and they ended up using it on, on the show, if you recall. So, so just, you know, thank you for that. You know. Fazi, yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I mean, I think I sort of inherently, when I walk into a room of, you know, when you're pitching a show, like I identify as queer and Muslim and Pakistani. And so everyone's like, what? How is that possible? And I'm like, it's possible. I'm right here. I'm not a hologram. And so that's a reaction that's not uncommon in executive spaces. But also when I walk in a room and I'm pitching something, I'm 
pitching something that is deeply about the intersectional spaces, about Muslim identity, and that mean you know that means all of us. I mean, if there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world, there are a lot of different kinds of Muslims, and you know whether that's in whether we wear hijab or not, or what country we're from. I mean, there is so our how, our, our sexual orientation. There's so much to talk about. And you know, one of the things that I'm really excited about doing is I'm developing a show right now that is a Muslim women show, uh, which I have to tell you, Runda Gerar is one of my prototype characters in my dream world. She writes on the show and stars in it as well. But you know, it's 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 very much about the fact that there are too many Muslim women for one voice to represent oh, all, um, and and what that means, and 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 the the thing in Hollywood is is that when there is one show, that means there can't be another, yeah. right? And so the key is to say, no, 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 no. I am not all of us, therefore there needs to be a lot of shows to be for everyone. Um, yeah. Right, uh, could, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, because I think uh, there was a time and I'm glad we're past this time, that in order to understand what it meant to be Muslim, you had to put it in a box. Um, and so for that, for most people, that was the hijabi woman. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of, it, it's that chicken and egg thing, because now there's more stories because there were more stories. So it just, it's, it's, a, it's a great time for, this, for us to be doing this. And um, it's, you know, the people that were given the chance or that blazed the trail, which I have to say actually have been mainly, you know, no disrespect and not putting this down, but they've been mainly men, right? Yeah. Um, and because, again, it's kind of it maybe, I can only speak for myself, but I know that I, I always refer to this, this panel. Um, Sue asked me to speak on a panel many years ago, being Muslim in Hollywood, and I thought, I don't know that I can ask, talk to, speak to that because I'm not hijabi. I don't really you know, practice all of the things. And I, would, and I realized being on that panel in that moment how much of a disservice I was doing to myself and other Muslims because I was, I was kind of, buying into that stereotype because there were no other stories out there. So it's, for me, it's been just kind of this chicken and egg thing and sort of checking in and am I doing the right thing? And like the more voices that there are that give me permission, mm -hmm. um, you know, right. the better, so. And, and Zara, I was gonna just ask you to just yeah. tell a quick story about Warner Brothers and how you were in, you know, integral in getting us involved. In yeah, um, well, to your point, Acer, I was just going to say uh, sometimes I think that time is passing now, thankfully, but sometimes when you're the only Muslim involved in a project, the burden of representation and any questions that might come up, like, is this okay, is this okay, it falls to you. And it's a very strange position as the actor who um, ultimately has no creative control ultimately at what the final project product is going to be, the buck does kind of stop at you in the sense. So there is that pressure to speak up if you feel like you can speak up, if, if something warrants speaking up. Um, but that's an enormous pressure to put on the actor, the person who is hired there to, you know, to do the emotional art of the piece. And we shouldn't be relying on actors to be the expert because that is not what you've hired them to do. So I'm so glad that we are moving into a period where more and more shows, uh, where impact, where the work you do, Sue, exists, where you can hire consultants to, um, so that burden is lifted off of the actor or the sole writer or the sole whatever they are, Muslim in the room. Um, a little bit about the Warner Brothers yeah. story. So I play a character in an animated series called Young Justice. I play a character named Halo, who visibly is a hijabi um, Middle Eastern refugee girl. And there's more to her story as the season unfolds. Spoilers! You find out that she is an alien supercomputer who has re resurrected the body of this teenager. Um, the computer identifies as non-binary, and throughout the season you see the computer, they're attracted to both men and women. Um, so there's a lot going on with this character that I play. Uh, I th and the first season she's introduced, uh, there was a lot of polarizing fan reaction to this character from the Muslim community, from the non-binary community, from the bisexual community. Um, and I feel like uh, the series creators 
have been so well-intentioned their entire careers, and they are keep pushing the envelope in bringing diversity to the table in their projects across the board. But I think what this taught them was that they needed to seek more outside help from consulting groups. And so I was so happy to make the introduction to Sue and MPAC um, so that for moving forward in their next season, they can tackle some of these things that they'd already given immense thought to. They can tackle it with more than one voice from those communities coming in to help inform those decisions. Okay. And I just wanted to add, it was, it was because also of your relationship with the showrunner yes. that you were a, you had that space to do it. Yes. And, and so that was a big deal. Absolutely. Right. I think you have to feel comfortable with the people you're working with. And oftentimes as an actor, when you're hired for the day or for the week, you don't have that intimacy and familiarity and agency in the process to say, hey, this is problematic. Um, so it really helps. I think the best thing any of us can do in the entertainment industry is to be your authentic self with all the intersectionality that exists mm -hmm. wherein and form real relationships with people. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I think to move the needle yeah. a little bit. And, and before we get to the, to the harder questions, I, Kasim, you're working on some projects you really can't talk about with a major network, you can't, yeah, say. But can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you're navigating um, the executives and the creatives at, at this major, major network? Uh, sure, I mean, it's... I was hoping you could talk about it by I now. Know. I know, yeah. Me it's too. Okay. It's okay, it, don't, don't um, worry. Um, so it's, uh, so the question, the question was how do you, can, can you repeat the, the actual, the question? The whole question, like basically, like how are you navigating the non-Muslim creatives and executives? Right, right, okay. Because yeah, so, you're, you're, okay. what you're working on has a story arc. Right, right, Muslim, yeah. right. So I, I think, you know, like everyone's up here saying, it's, this, is, this is changing right now. And we're in the middle of, I think it's a revolution in a, in a lot of ways. And out in the streets, online, and film and TV. I've, I've never seen as, as many uh, diverse in, in voice, and people want to hear it, people want to know. The executives want this stuff. Because I think, I, I think, so when you're in a, when you're in a position where, uh, like the, the industry we're in, uh, for a very long time the stories were all told by one group of people, right? So like, you have, you know, white people doing blackface and making my people look like, like animals, right? For a hundred years, like <laughs> this happened. And so you're out on the streets and someone sees someone like me and they're afraid. Cause all you've ever seen them as is these animals. They're violent, they're aggressive, they're... And so you, you ha we're at a point right now where, where people said, the people who were being represented by other people have said, nah man, I wanna, I wanna tell my stories. And, and it, took, it, you know, it took some fighting and it took some real work, but I think we're right now in a place where, where they're starting to listen. The networks, the studios, they're starting to listen and they, and they understand that there is a, a want for it. Uh, because without, without the, the want for it, without the, the audience for it, I'm not sure that they ever start to go that way, but I, I think they're beginning to see that there's a, there's a real hunger for truth right now. In, in an era where it's hard to, like you don't know it's true, anymore, right? right? But I think there's a, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a hunger for, for truth, and, and I think we're going to get past this, and, and part of it is going to be us, us telling these, these honest stories. Right. Well, let's, let's get to the harder questions, and I really want to set it that up. That was an easy so, question. Yeah. <laughs> just wait. Um, let, me, let me just kind of set it up, okay? Um, so American Muslim creatives are experiencing a new phenomenon in the industry. While we still have a ways to go, more than ever, than any other t more than any other time, the industry is reaching out to us to see more Muslim characters and storylines on TV and film created by and about Muslims, kind of to your point, Qasim. Your work is so crucial in leveraging the industry to help normalize Muslims. And I use the word normalize, I'm in air quotes, I'll just say air quotes, because it's a better word than humanize, um, which is also an insult. But right now we are being normalized. Of course, no one portrayal can cover the spectrum of what it means to be a Muslim. So take, for example, Hulu's Rami. How many of you have seen Rami? Great. 
It's been widely embraced by audiences across the country. However, there is a stark, stark division among American Muslim communities. Many see it as authentic and nuanced, but it also has been criticized by many in the community for its use of sex and portrayal of Muslim women. In fact, after its release, Rami Youssef wrote an op-ed in The Hollywood Reporter explaining that Rami was his story and that he wasn't trying to reflect the journey of all Muslims. So the question here now, here's the question. In creating or portraying authentic Muslim characters, how can we help the community understand that not every portrayal is going to be their experience? Um, I, I, so I can, I can speak to that, because I, I went through a lot of that when I made my first film, Muslim. And I mean, it, it's, so I think there's a tendency to, uh, I guess the answer would, would be that my answer would be this. Whether or not we are in it, they're going to make, they're going to tell the stories anyway. And they are probably going to do a much worse job because they only have certain ideas of who we are. I have never seen in my life an immediate and destructive portrayal of a people than I saw post 9-11 of Muslim people in media, I just, it just immediately became the, the terrorism narrative, the, the, the angry Muslim narrative. I, I, and all of a sudden, it just, th things changed in this country for Muslim, Muslim folks. I, I'm, not, I'm not even identifiably Muslim, but like when I come back to the United States, I've been detained three times because my name is Muhammad Al Qasim Ibn Abdul Basir, right? Like I've, I've experienced a level of, I mean, I couldn't like send on your money. On like, your passport, oh, yeah. Yeah, like of course on your you're going to yeah. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So like, but just, just like understanding, like just watching that thing happen and, 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 and now saying, all right, well, we want to tell some stories that, you know, that are honest. And, you know, you, it's like, well, well, don't show that. Don't, don't show that. It's like, well, wait a minute. This, this is what your kids are going through. Like, if you don't show it, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you, if you can't talk about it, if we can't, like, tell stories about it, it it's probably going to be brushed under the rug and happen, you know, in, in secret anyway. So why not have the, the conversations, tell the stories, and, like, let's act like this stuff is really happening? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I mean, so much of our, my work is about identity. So it's always about being Muslim and brown and American and Canadian and Pakistani and from here and there and complicated relationship with my mother and about my queer identity. And so I have, you know, just being a person in all of these communities, I feel like just to be alive and be a person and to feel safe, people say, you can't be that, you, you don't represent us. So I feel like as a queer Muslim, I face that anyway. And then in my work, I, I definitely experience that from community. And I feel like, you know, what's, what's exactly what you're saying, they're gonna tell the stories regardless. And, and the truth is, it's like, it's not just about a queer identity that may, you may feel like doesn't represent you. It's that, I put a tweet out uh, about two months ago, and it was, you know, I'm developing a show about Muslim women. Muslim women, what do you want to see? There were so, and I would say alhamdulillah, there were so many responses. None of them were the same. None of them were the same. So what that means, again, is that it's not just about like, well, this one queer person doesn't represent my experience. It's that there are so many of us around the world from so many different countries and backgrounds and experiences that not one story ever will reflect us, and that's okay. Now, does that mean that I think Rami is a perfect narrative? No. But what it does mean is that it is an example of the fact that look how much more we need to do and how we need to make. We should have a hundred Muslim shows. There's a hundred straight right. white guy from mi the Midwest shows. Yep. You know, we need a hundred Muslim shows. Like looking around this room, if you look around at each other, like every single story in here matters. And so I hear that and what I say to that is that to me is fuel. It is fuel to us as creators to uh, you know, break down the b barriers inside of ourselves. Like, why am I not telling my story? Why am I afraid to talk about what happened to me? Why don't I talk about who I am 
in spaces, whether it's executive spaces or Muslim spaces or in family spaces. Um, and I think there's opportunity. There's, there, like you said, it is a terrifying and yet really beautiful time to be creating. Um, and I also think there's opportunity for Muslims to take jobs as executives. You know, like, yes, we need Muslim artists. Yeah, yeah, go get that job. Yeah, you know, but, but, but it's something that I don't know if we talk about enough is that there's also a lot of need on the pr development side for Muslims to have those gatekeeper roles and those decision-making roles so that you will say, okay, cool, like, I don't need to rely just on the creator. I don't need to rely just on the actor. I am Muslim. I got my whole community to reach out to and hire personally or, you know, what have you. And, and I think that is something we need to talk about. These are well-paying jobs, y'all. <laughs> These are well-paying jobs with benefits, you know, for your kids to go and get, and, and they're out there to be had. And it almost doesn't exist, right? A Muslim executive? Yes. I mean, I've been in hundreds of rooms with executives, and, you know, it's, that's not a thing that ever happens, where Muslim, I'm like, yeah. oh, Muhammad, what? What up? <laughs> like, bruh, my name is... Most popular name. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the more, uh, just my thing is just be authentic. Like, just tell your stories. And I think it's, um, uh, I just lost my train of thought, which I tend to do. But um, go ahead. Do you want me to repeat the question? Or are you yes, please. <laughs> so, so basically, no one portrayal, no one character can portray, right, okay. all, represent all Muslims. Right. How, how can we, how can we I got it. get there faster with the community? Uh, just you have to just tell your story and you have to be brave enough and again speaking from my experience when I was writing this book um, about being it's a comic memoir and so I hid behind comedy for the first draft and then we sent it out and people were saying that I, I, I was fortunate and then I was able to get the feedback from the the rejections that we got from the publishers and the original um, pass was she's getting too much in her way and I realized I was trying to hide behind comedy I wasn't being authentic. I wasn't being me because I thought, who's gonna care? I didn't get shot trying to go to school. What's my story? You know what I mean? Like, and again, it's and and um, so I, as I was writing the book, I was talking to people, both both Muslim and non-Muslim, and through that, people were saying, "Oh, that's pretty cool." I, oh yeah, my mother does this, and she's Romanian or whatever. And I realized the connection, and I was like, okay, I, that emboldened me. You know, and then um, I teach screenwriting as well. I teach short film writing to my students and every single person, and they're, they're young too, and I've also taught older, um, older, like in their 40s and above, and they always say, I don't have an interesting story. And then they launch into the most fascinating story, <laughs> right? It's like, you think, I thought it was, I had to, it was something, you know, I had to I have escaped a harrowing, you know, like horrible abuse back in the old country and came to the States and all that. And I didn't have any of that. I was just, you know, people didn't know how to pronounce my name and I grew up in Kentucky and, you know, I wanted to date, whatever, you know. But there's, there's enough people like me out there that I was, I, I wrote it because I wanted it to, I, I wished it existed when I was younger. And so my advice would be just tell the story that you wish had existed. Tell the story that you want to see because then you're going to be authentic. And um, you can't go wrong when you're authentic. No, sir? Uh, yeah, so, so I think what we're ex experiencing now is what we call like the, the pioneer effect. Like this is the first Muslim show about like, it's a very Muslim centric in a major network. So I think it will get that backlash because this is a fluke, right? Like everybody would think it's relatable. Um, if you have like 10 shows on the other hand about Muslim characters, you will not face the same effect. Um, but I will say this, like from storytelling um, standpoint, I think the more you showcase that detail of the character and you talk less about it, the more it becomes yeah. effective and relatable. So, you know, our showrunner like Krista Vernoff and even Shonda Rhimes, in all of her shows, like you can see like in all her characters, they would never say like, oh, he, she's a black doctor. Or like, you know, I lived through the age of segregation and this is what I, you know, had like trouble with even the Muslim characters that we presented the word Muslim was never mentioned in the show and that what makes it more effective because like the audience would actually respond to a character that is not too on the nose and if you have that character who's like normal just like you I mean 
we don't know like Don Draper was Christian, like yeah. from Mad Men. Like we didn't question that because that's, you know, the dominant uh, people that you're, you're dealing with. So I think here, the, le the less you talk about the fact that you're being Muslim and just like show it as a detail. And I'll tell you an example, like we presented even like a, a patient story that were like Muslims, uh, but we did not really say that word that they're Muslim. They, we could just like show that the, his daughter was having surgery and he was like um, holding the masbaha, like the, the bead mm -hmm. and praying as a gesture like, oh, this is a Muslim character. So it makes it more, I actually like the word humanizing because I think we were de dehumanized in the, in, the, in, the, in the past, like in Homeland. Um, so that's my opinion about it, is just to talk less about it, make it a yes. detail orbiting around the character. Great. Zara, I, and then, I, then we'll go to the next question. I completely agree with that statement. As, as an actor, when I approach a character, and if, if, if I'm playing a character who is Muslim, um, I play a character in a Nickelodeon animated series who is Muslim, um, but when I was creating the sound of her, I wanted Muslim to not be the first thing that you think of when you see her, even though she wears a hijab. I wanted you to say, oh yeah, Zara, she's the sarcastic one. Why is she sarcastic? Because she's deeply sensitive inside. And so she uses her sarcasm as a shield. And you know, she's hip and funny and cool. Oh, oh yeah, she happens to be wearing a hijab. Like it's, what can you make around the character that doesn't emphasize their faith or their, you know, those circumstances, because that's what really you connect with. Like, when you think about the shows you like as a viewer, the connections, the, the characters, and the stories you feel resonate with you, it's, for me, it's never about, oh, they share the same faith I do, I feel like they're me. It's, oh, that's my personality, or oh, that happened to me. Like, I love Luke Skywalker. <laughs> We've spent our entire, like, past several, decades learning to identify and empathize with the white male journey. And we don't say Luke Skywalker stands for all white men, you know? And so everyone can learn to identify with anybody as long as there's that emotional connection there. And I agree completely, the less religion is highlighted and the more it's just part of the whole fabric of that character, the more effect you're gonna have on people. Uh, I just want to say real quick, I, I, I agree with that sometimes. I also think I feel really strongly, and, and potentially it's because of my queer identity, I feel really strongly about telling people, no, 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 we're Muslim, y'all. Like, we are Muslim, and I, I love that, and I think it's about how it's done, and it's about sort of a, a, a just a, a layered, nuanced approach to it. Um, and I wanted to say that maybe this seems a little off, but I was thinking about how do we not just we on stage as creators, but how do we also support a nuanced narrative? As part of this pioneer wave, I think part of it is also, what do we go out and support with our dollars? Because Hollywood is really just about commodifying, right? And it's all about money. So what you all can do, what we all can always do is whatever that narrative is, whether you, you know, go, go spend your money on it. I know, it's like, uh, spend money. But, but that is how they know that we exist, and our voices matter. I mean, there was a show that came, a movie that came out, it was like a doc hybrid called Meet the Patels. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, this really funny South Asian guy, and he, he made this doc about his family. Every Patel in the country, <laughs> in the world, went to see that film. <laughs> Every Patel. And then suddenly Hollywood was like, wow, these Patels, they got a lot of money. And the rest of us are like, <laughs> we knew, you know? <laughs> And so what happens then is suddenly they looked at us, the South Asian buying power in film as something that mattered. And that is the kind of thing, when we show up and we spend money, when we go and watch your show and your movies and your movies and buy your book, and, and so go buy the books, that tells people, oh my gosh, the Muslim voice as a buying, they matter. This ummah matters. And they are, they are all across the board. They are a spectrum of voices. Go ahead. Um, Thank you, Professor. I just wanted to add one point. Like, I think the audience really, you know, respond more to empowering stories. Like, we are wired this way. I think one of the elements also is to show, like, victimizing roles is also not helpful, right. yeah. especially for Muslims. Like, people would not really want to watch that. But sure, if we wanted to make it a detail of this story point, that, you know, I struggled to fit in, and, but here I am, like, I learned the language perfectly, and I'm, like, integrated, and I'm a successful doctor. Like, it's, it's about, like, what do you do in order to make that failure into success? Um, so I think really avoiding that kind of, like, the, you know, I'm a, the victim is a very important, like, narrative that we have to always 
think Absolutely. about it. So would you all agree to the following statement until we have 100 Ramis or signature moves or you know whatever um, wrong end of the table TV series, would you agree that narratives that polarize for the time being are better than lack of narratives? Absolutely. Yeah. You, can't, you can't take the second step until you take the first. Absolutely. That was really rhetorical, but I just wanted one of you to <laughs> yeah. say absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That was a very lawyerly question, Wasn't it Sue. Wasn't it yeah. Are you sure you're not a lawyer? No, nope. no. Nope. But but you know, I I I am a woman of a certain age, and I and I grew up where I saw no one like me on TV, yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, we talk about this a lot because you know, yeah, and and I it, 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 I'm not gonna out you, but but um, <laughs> my point is, like for example, CBS's um, FBI got a lot of criticism from the community because. You know, the, F, uh, the real FBI, you know, has been guilty of, of profiling Muslim communities and other minority communities, and there was a lot of criticism of, you know, you know, why are they showing the good Muslim character as the FBI agent? But it's like, wait a second, they hired a real Muslim to pay, play a Muslim. Like, we are taking small steps. So, inshallah, in like three to four years, this is not going to be a topic of conversation. And, and, and you know, I just wanted to um, say thank you for all your thoughts. So the next question is, what would you like the community to know about the industry? I really think that the industry is still very, um, I don't want to use the word ignorant, but like there's a lot of education. It's not true, because like I'm a medical consultant for Grey's Anatomy. They don't understand the medicine. So it's my duty to deliver authentic medicine. So that's the role of being a consultant is to always be like very faithful to what you're representing. I think there's still a lack of understanding of uh, what Islam is and what Muslim people are, even after 10 years like of really huge, significant paradigm shift. And I have to tell you, like, I used to be asked like if I used to go to college in a camel or like I've, I lived in a tent. These questions are gone now. Like it's a whole different perspective about Muslims. Um, so I think what we need to know is like they really don't have an understanding because they only now are starting to understand this like you know like group of people, and I think it's it's very essential for us to really speak our truths and speak our realities and you know be present. Right. Yep. Awesome. Uh, just just in general about yeah, how. What would you like the community to know about? The industry, your work. Well, I, I, I guess I'd speak more to people who are trying to get into it. That um, it, it's 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 quite difficult as a profession, just in general. Like it's it's hard, but it's not. Uh, but it, but there's no like gate or there's no secret, right? There's it's just like really hard work and being good at being good at it. You actually can 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 get somewhere in this business, right? It's it's literally saying okay. I'm interested in, in the arts, I'm interested in film, TV, acting, and I, and I am going to make sure to perfect this and, get, and, and keep getting better and, and keep trying. Uh, it, it seems like uh, a, a little more time, probably a lot more time than many other professions, but uh, I guess I, I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's, it's definitely possible. You know. um, I guess I would say for those of you who are feeling skeptical or pessimistic about people's understanding of Muslims in, in media and, you know, I mean, yes, there's a lot of ignorance. There's a lot of assumptions being made. But uh, I was on set last night actually filming for a show that's coming out next year. Uh, and I was playing a character who was uh, going to be in a mosque. And I was wearing red nail polish. And the makeup a uh, person asked if she could take off the red nail polish and paint this beautiful nude color on there because there had been a series, a chain of emails at the studio for weeks about what would be appropriate or not appropriate for women to wear at this mosque. And it put me in a kind of strange position as a Muslim woman myself being told, oh, this is what would probably happen, so we have to do this. But it's not coming from a place of malice, it's coming from a place of the desire to get it right and to not mess up. And there's a lot of discussion that's happening about it behind the scenes that we as the audience are not privy to. So there's a lot of hope to be had, I think. Great, I, that's wonderful, agreed. Pause you. Um, what do I think about Hollywood that I wanna share? <laughs> Uh, God, I had some thoughts, and now they're gone a little bit. Um, I think Hollywood's a pyramid scheme. 
Yeah, tell us uh, about the money, the money that can be had. Yeah, in the yeah. I mean, it's a complete pyramid scheme. You know what I mean? You're like, I'm gonna buy a lotto ticket because it's like we all want to be like as big as Disney or Ava DuVernay. Like that's obviously a dream that we all want to have or should have because that's what keeps us going. And the reality is, and I think actually when we think about Islam and like the really some of the beautiful ideals there, it's like it's not just about that. What is success? What is what is happiness? What is love? What is wealth? I think truly it's about like much smaller things and it's about much more individual connection and love and meditation and, and peacefulness and calm and et cetera, et cetera. This, all this other stuff, it's awesome, but it's, it's, it's a pyramid scheme. Um, I don't know, I had something else and I kind of lost it. Um, I feel like we're all creators, which is kind of cool. Um, I lost it, man. It's okay. Well, to, I don't know. To your point. Hit me up later. To your point that you said earlier about it being a business. I mean, it's. Yeah. It's show business. It's they are, especially when it comes to TV, which is like, and and somebody mentioned that like the the it's it's very corporate, right? Like yeah. you have so many like yeah, oh, the, I I I feel like maybe the the note was like probably like a chain of emails where it started with really small, you know what I mean, yeah. about the, this darned red nail polish. But it's 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 a it's a business, and if people are consuming this, if people want to see the brown person, the beige person, the whatever person doing whatever, then they're gonna make those stories. You know, I mean, I feel like right now is a perfect time because of what's happening in the world, like what's happening just very east of us that's, you know, going on over there in Washington. And there's so much vitriol coming out of that that if we have other voices that can combat that, I always use these very incendiary combat, I shouldn't say combat. Yeah, yeah we talked about that. <laughs> It's very explosive. Um. <laughs> well, and what I was going to say is kind of, you jogged my memory a little bit, is that it's important to know that like whatever anybody hears, whatever part of what we're involved with, even if we're an executive producer or a, a creator of a show, there are still so many hands and voices above ours that all have impact. And, and it's, it's not just, I wrote this, here you go. We are making right. this thing exactly as. There are so many, and in just in a, if all of us made a film together, that would be true of that film. But in Hollywood, the bigger the project, the more voices, the more hands, the more people, the more narratives that have impacted what that story is going to be. Um, and sometimes that's really beautiful. I believe in collaboration, and sometimes that can be challenging. It's actually almost, it, there's always a little bit of a challenge in that kind of collaboration. Because um, everybody has notes, and sometimes yeah. it's like somebody's uncle or whatever that has yeah. notes, or somebody's cousin. So but. I want to now get questions from the audience. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, my name is Halima, I'm a Gen Z activist from the Bay Area, and really excited to be here. Uh, my question was around social media, so we're in a time and age where we actually have the ability to own our platforms and create our own narratives, and I've been able to use social media to do that. Um, I'm wondering how we can take that and like really empower people in the community, local leaders, to be able to use and create their own platforms to change the narrative, um, even if you're not an executive producer um, you know, in Hollywood, but if you're just someone in the community who's like, okay, I have like 15,000 followers, how do I you know, strategically use that to change the narrative? That's a fantastic question. Um, I am social media of, well, I, so, I should say social media light. When I was uh, writing this book, it, you would be surprised how much your followers matter. Um, and I, it just, I think it's, it's um, finding a brand, basically, finding, you know, literally a color scheme, you know, like for my, my book is pink, so I had to do pink things and things like that. And just posting at the same time, posting on brand, uh, posting on message, because people now want to consume no more than 15 seconds. I mean, I edit, and I've been editing short form, which is two and a half minutes, but they're like, no, 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 we have to do 15 seconds is the longest that people will look at stuff. So anybody can, you know, anybody can cre create. You can take your phone. Now there's TikTok, which edits it for you, you know, all of this stuff. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, but that's my uh, I just, I was just thinking, I just did my first TikTok today. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. It's about a dog and a human. Um, the other thing I was thinking, uh, the tiny thing, I, I, I've seen a successful 
site uh, which they do highlights of people that they want their followers to know about. So they'll do like a weekly post that is specific to highlighting whether it's an artist or an activist in the community, whether that's local Bay Area community or Muslim community internationally, but people that they're like, I want, these are, these are people who are doing the work also. So I feel like <laughs> using social media to amplify other folks and other, other views is kind of a, a great thing that we as Muslims can do. And hashtags. Yeah, Hashtag. I, uh, I work on a lot of projects for kids and teenagers, and so I have a lot of young people following me on social media, which is terrifying, but also really exciting, because get them when they're young. And uh, so I always post a Ramadan post. I always post very casually about Muslim things, um, just again, in that attempt to normalize it and kind of just get, like, this is like, um, I posted Pride Mubarak, which got some interesting comments from both sides of, of, of the spectrum. Um, but like, it was like, hey, no, this is, this is who I am. This is how I in, in, integrate Islam in my life. And this is equally as authentic and Muslim as anything else that's out there. So it, it's just a matter of being yourself and then totally like um, signal boosting others who are doing great work. Thank you for um, representing part of the revolution, which is just seeing the whole spectrum of what a Muslim looks like. I finally, after being here since the age of 10, have figured out when people say, oh, but you don't look like a Muslim, I finally figured out an answer I can give very comfortably. I say, this is what all the Muslims I know look like. I have to exaggerate a little bit. Of course, I know Muslims who look like, <laughs> you know, with hijab and all of that. But, um, but the thing you guys mentioned is ignorance. So once we get past the top, which is, look at the, you know, the whole spectrum of what Muslims look like and behave like and are like. The ignorance part, I, yesterday, somebody said grace and said, Lord Jesus Christ, and I said, you know, in Islam, we have Jesus also, and she was shocked. She was a 70-year-old woman growing up here, and I just felt like, oh, we just have to start from zero. What, you know, we have Adam, we have Noah. I mean, these are, your stories are our stories too. We have those stories and I just feel the ignorance gets to me. So what, when can we address the ignorance? Right at the moment, right at that moment. You just, it's just dialogue. I mean, you really have to just, we have to have dialogue and people think that, okay, you're gonna get political and I'm gonna agree to disagree. It's not, you just have to just, Nothing bad can come from a respectful discourse. And I think it's because sometimes they don't, I mean, if she's 70, you know what I mean? Like, I had a lot of, I had a lot of ignorance. At, uh, and I'm in of the faith, you know, about what it is. So it's just literally having, you know, if somebody said, hey, your hat is, you know, you've got a, a green hat on, you're like, no, 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 it's, it's literally that simple. And it's hard to do that because we all come from this like emotional place of like, oh, are you insulting me? Are you do you know? And it, you really have to kind of take a step back and go, they're coming from their own intersectionality and their own experiences. So that's. I would just caveat that with you know if it feels safe to do so and if it feels like you have the energy to do so that, that day you know because you know I feel like you know some folks are visibly Muslim to non-Muslim people some folks are not visibly Muslim some people are visibly queer some whatever that means some people are not so I feel like in terms of like a coming out like I feel like I have to come out every single day and I know we can all relate to the experience of getting into an Uber or a Lyft and someone's like oh your name Falzia yes where are you from and you know like that it's like do I want to have that conversation in that day and I don't know what's gonna happen here so some days it's like there's a lack I don't want to engage because I don't know where that conversation is gonna go so I think really it's a matter of like yes if you can and then also I would say non-muslims should also you know we need allies we need allies, no matter who we are and what identity we're talking about, to step in and speak up as well and do that work because we shouldn't always have to be defending ourselves at all times. That's good. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, um, so I think in terms of ignorance, I think the more nuanced and varied these stories are that come out, that, inv that include people who, are, who identify themselves as Muslims and across the spectrum, the, the better off we're, we're all gonna be, right? Like when, when there's a TV show, like when there's, people are inviting you into their home when you are, when you are on their TV, right? And especially if they're watching your, your show every week and they're allowing you to say a thing to them 
every week for one hour or 30 minutes. And that thing can essentially change, completely change someone's perspective about a people, about a faith. It actually can. It's done it for me. And so the more opportunities we get to have more stories that are, that are, that are nuanced and varied, I, I believe the, 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 the stories will do this and the ignorance will do this. So I, I'm going to tie off the two questions because I think they, you know, trickle down to the same effect, which is basically raising awareness and, and I think sharing your own story. And I'll tell you, like, it, you know, for, for instance, like in, in the writer's room in Grey's Anatomy, I'm, I'm originally from Iraq, uh, born and raised there. Um, when I told them, like, some details about our lives there, they were fascinated. Like, when I told them, like, about our AIDS, like, how we, you know, by new clothes and like go to our seventh neighbor and like exchange like have tea time and tea party and biscuit and like talk about these things they really changed their their whole perspective about what iraq is and it came from a place of power because i had the voice to speak so i think if we can raise that awareness in social media just like give a little detail about what muslims do in ramadan i mean you can see the impact that we can change and it, i would say if it's delivered with originality and simplicity and like uniqueness, people will listen. Hi, I'm Evelyn Asultani. I'm a professor at USC and I study representations of Muslims in the media. Thank you all so much for this fascinating panel. My question is, uh, what do you think has led to this modest expansion in representations? And I've been trying to figure out to what extent is it social responsibility, Muslim ban happened and people responded. Or to what extent is it, Oscar's so white, there's this controversy, and they don't want to be embroiled in, in controversy. Or to what extent is it the audiences responding and asking for this in the box office? So I was curious to hear what you think, or what you've heard in the areas that you work in that led to this modest expansion. It's Thank you. all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's all of it. This is a, like, man, we are in a fight now. Mm -hmm. and, and this is part of it saying, and, and it, just didn't, it didn't just happen, right? It didn't just one day, they got up like, oh, let's start telling these. No, it was for years, people literally marching and being on Twitter and being in, in the offices and saying like, we're not going to stand for this. So yes, Oscar So White is a part of it. Yes, the, the Muslim ban was a part of it. Yes, and then the reaction of the people that stood up because of it, right? And so I think it's just a matter, like let's not get comfortable in assuming like that's just gonna continue by, by itself, like I think it it's going to continue to need people to stand up and say no. I want I I want more. I want better, and 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 hopefully they'll continue to respond to it. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Farmrani. I am a South Asian Muslim Canadian, and I'm also an actor. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I have often been confronted with being asked to do accents, and a whole spectrum of accents from South Asian diaspora to Middle Eastern and North African even. And I am wondering, as the performers, how have you negotiated those experiences? And then also for the creators, how, like, what are your perspectives on accents? And the second part to that is, do you feel, have you seen how your non-Muslim and white counterparts have been scrutinized in the same way? I mean, you hit the nail on the head. They aren't scrutinized in the same way at all. <laughs> um, I feel like I play a lot of South Asian characters and a lot of Muslim characters from different parts of the world. It is such a relief when I'm asked to use my own voice and my own accent. Uh, that being said, I am very proficient in South Asian accents and I have the luxury of playing a character who's from a fictionalized Middle Eastern country. So the style of that accent was set by actors in the past and I continue to kind of follow their lead and it's, you can create a little bit, you don't have to be so specific. Um, but the thing that comes with that is you do then get a lot of scrutiny like, ah, the accent's not quite right or ah, why, why are they doing this? Um, it's tough, it's a tough position to continually be asked to be put in. Uh, I, part of it is because I do so much voice work, I like to think that I'm called upon to do it because I'm excellent at it, but really I think I get called upon to do it because I'm not white, because I'm the ethnic choice. Therefore, I can do any accent, can't I? Um, and I do not think that burden is on our white counterparts, and I do not think they are scrutinized in that way about southern accents or British accents. Um, 
it's tough. It's tough to negotiate, but the thing to recognize is if you have that skill set in your bag and you're called upon to bring it out, bam, put it on the table, get that job, and then get the 10 other parts that don't require you to have the accent because you've built your resume up with stuff that your ethnicity got the door open a little bit for you. Uh, well, and I just wanted to say, too, that um, I... I, I, I'm not acting, I'm acting mostly in my own work, I guess, at this point, although hire me if you want, I'm happy to. Um, but um, I've definitely, you know, it's like being, you know, I mean, being ethnically ambiguous ha was the thing for the longest time, right? So if you could play what you are, so South Asian, oh, and you can also play the Latin mo ex mom, uh, you know, they didn't call it Latin ex before, right? So, so, and you can play this. So, so I, there was a time where everybody went in for all the ethnicities they look like. And in other countries, they still do that a lot more often than they do here in Canada and the US. Um, I've stopped doing that. Like, I will never go in for a role unless, you know, I won't, unless it's like a voice role feels different to me. Um, if it's Muslim, right? depending on that identity, but I won't go in for a, a role that asks me to play like a character that's supposed to be a different kind of, you know, a different race. Um, that I, just, I just don't do that anymore. Accents, I feel like, you know, like in terms, you know, I've done stand-up, I've done a one-woman play, I perform as my mother, I write about my mother. I, I think accents are a true part of who we are. But I also, th and, it's not a but, it's an and, and how is the accent being used? Is the accent the butt of the joke, right? Like if it's the butt of the joke, that's a problem. And I think we especially see that in stand-up comedy, which I think stand-up has historically been a really toxic, you know, straight white male dominated space. And so I know some people like Hari Kandabalu, like he won't even do accents at all because to him he's like, you're not laughing with me, you're laughing at my family's accent. And so I won't do that anymore. Um, so to me it's like, why are you telling us this story? What more is it that we're gonna learn about who this person is that matters? And then also in terms of representation on, on, on camera, like I love it when someone's accent is good. It's, I do struggle with it. If someone's hired who doesn't, isn't, that's not their native voice, if they're doing an accent that's really bad, because I'm like, man, come on. If we worked just a little bit harder, you could have maybe cast someone else. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, like, I think of like in the NBC show, NBC show, I Feel Bad, I mean, that was like a beautiful show with uh, Amy, an Amy Poehler show. Um, Sorry, you blue was the star, but I f I'm pretty sure. And if any, if I'm wrong, please tell me. The father who was playing her South Asian father in that show is a is a guy who's not South Asian, but is historically. I think he is South Asian. I don't actually. know. He's British South Asian. Is he? Is he? Yeah, I believe so. For sure. To IMDb. Because right. in IMDb, it's <laughs> like Google his it. his his dad is born in India. His mom is from here. He never says he's Indian. So I'm like, how do we find that out? You know, like that being, like there's, there's, there's that kind of thing. And he historically plays a swath of Jewish, Muslim, South Asian, Middle Eastern act characters. So that's complicated in and of itself, right? So, so I, I want to end on the thing I said before. <laughs> right. At least he's not so, Alfred Molina. So, so I, I agree with Fazia, like because I, I don't think we need to stigmatize like accents, but more celebrate it. I think it's part of the character study. Like it's, if you, it depends on the context, context of the character. So we had like a character who is a Syrian refugee. I mean, typically he would have an accent and we should like celebrate this identity of him. But if you're talking about like a person who was born and raised in the United States of South Asian origin, I mean, he should not have one. So it's, it depends on the character. <laughs>